Welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology series on the blood vessels. My name is Dr. Wallace. Today, we're going to be talking about capillary exchange. Capillary exchange refers to the movement of fluid and solutes across capillary walls. During capillary exchange, we see that water, ions like sodium and potassium and chloride, nutrients like glucose and fatty acids, as well as wastes and the respiratory gases, oxygen and CO2, all get exchanged between the blood and the interstitial fluid. When we look at this capillary exchange, we see that materials move across capillary walls via a few different forces. We'll look at diffusion, filtration, and reabsorption, all of which help to drive capillary exchange. We'll begin by looking at diffusion. Diffusion, remember, is the movement of ions or molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. When we look at capillary exchange and diffusion happening in and out of the bloodstream, we see that diffusion occurs very easily in our capillaries because our capillaries have very thin walls. Remember, when we look at our capillaries, we see that the capillary wall consists of really just an endothelium, which is a single layer of these thin endothelial cells. So this makes for a very, very short distance that materials have to diffuse across or travel across in order to get from the blood to the interstitial fluid or from the interstitial fluid into the bloodstream. When we look at how different solutes or different materials get in and out of the bloodstream, we see that depending on what the molecule is, it'll take a different route across capillary walls. For example, looking at things like water, ions, and small polar molecules like glucose, we see that these molecules are all what we call hydrophilic. That means that these are water-loving molecules. They don't like lipids. So these things cannot diffuse straight through these endothelial cells. They don't want to come in contact with the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the plasma membrane of these cells. So instead, these hydrophilic compounds like ions and glucose have to travel either between adjacent endothelial cells in slight little clefts or little spaces that we have between cells, or we see that they can travel through channels that are present in the plasma membranes. For example, we have sodium channels or potassium channels that are present in the membrane that allow these solutes to get past these endothelial cells without having to come in contact with the phospholipid bilayer. Finally, we see that these ions and water and polar molecules can go through the larger pores that are present in fenestrated capillaries. Remember, when we look at the intestines, um, when we look at the kidneys, we have fenestrated capillaries, which have larger pores present between endothelial cells. And these allow these hydrophilic compounds to diffuse in and out of the bloodstream very rapidly. When we look at larger water-soluble compounds or larger hydrophilic compounds, um, which includes some hormones as well as some polypeptides, we see that these solutes are too large to pass through the, the, the clefts or the small spaces that are present in our normal continuous capillaries. So these larger solutes can only cross in and out of the bloodstream via diffusion when we look through or when we look at our fenestrated capillaries. Remember, we just said those are the capillaries that have pores present and these larger pores will allow these larger solutes to cross in and out of the bloodstream. Again, we see these um, in some of our glands, some of our endocrine glands. Um, we see these fenestrated capillaries in the kidneys, and we see these fenestrated capillaries in the intestines. Lipids and lipid-soluble materials, for example, are respiratory gases like oxygen and like CO2. These are lipophilic, okay, lipophilic. Okay. 
these compounds are perfectly fine going through the plasma membrane of these endothelial cells. Okay, they like lipids, so they can go right through that phospholipid bilayer. So when we look at lipid um, soluble materials like oxygen and CO2, they will diffuse in and out of the bloodstream by going straight through the endothelial cells. There aren't any clefts or gaps needed for them to diffuse. Finally, very large um, solutes like plasma proteins and blood cells are too large to pass through the small clefts in our normal continuous capillaries. They're too large to pass through even the larger pores that are present in fenestrated capillaries. So plasma proteins and blood cells are only able to diffuse in and out of the bloodstream when we look at very specialized capillaries that are called sinusoids. These sinusoids have much larger gaps between endothelial cells that are big enough to allow plasma proteins and blood, and blood cells to diffuse in and out of the bloodstream. Um, we see these sinusoids, for example, in the liver where we make plasma proteins. So we need to have large gaps in our capillaries so that we can put these plasma proteins into the bloodstream. Um, we also see them in the bone marrow. which is where we make our blood cells and we have to put those blood cells into the bloodstream. So we need large gaps in the capillaries for that to happen. Um, we also see these in the spleen where we have numerous bloods, um, white blood cells that monitor the blood in order to be able to engulf old worn out blood cells, pathogens, etc. Capillary exchange is also driven by filtration. Filtration occurs when fluid and small solutes are driven across a porous membrane. Anything that's small enough to fit through the pores in the membrane goes through and the larger solutes get trapped. They can't make it through the porous membrane. When we look at our capillaries, we see that we have blood in the capillary and we have interstitial fluid surrounding the capillary. When we look at things getting filtered out of the bloodstream, we see that water and small solutes like ions get pushed or filtered out of the bloodstream, while larger solutes remain in the bloodstream because they're too large to fit through most of the pores or clefts that are present in most capillaries. So things like plasma proteins, and blood cells, do not get filtered out of the bloodstream um, in most of our capillaries. These large solutes remain in the blood. When we look at filtration, we see that it's driven by a pressure called hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure occurs because of the physical force of a liquid pushing against a surface when that liquid is in a contained space. So for example, our capillaries, the blood gets pushed into the capillaries and it's under pressure, it's pressurized. So the blood is pushing out on the walls of the capillaries. And as that blood pushes out on the walls of the capillaries, it pushes water and the small solutes from this area of high pressure towards the area of lower pressure. It filters things out of the bloodstream. When we look at filtration, um, and when we look at this hydrostatic pressure that fuels filtration, we see that we have to look at the net hydrostatic pressure or the overall hydrostatic pressure. There are two different pressures that go into calculating the net hydrostatic pressure. We have the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is the hydrostatic pressure of the blood pushing against the capillary walls. Okay, so the pressure of the blood pushing out. We also have interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. So the interstitial fluid also has its own pressure as that fluid pushes in against the capillary walls. Comparing these two pressures, we see that the capillary hydrostatic pressure is much greater than the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. So the pressure pushing out of the bloodstream is much greater than the pressure pushing back in. So when we look at the overall hydrostatic pressure, we see that it tends to push water and solutes out of the capillaries and into the interstitial fluid.
Okay, because the pressure pushing out is greater than the pressure pushing in. So hydrostatic pressure fuels filtration. It fuels the filtration of water and solutes from the blood into the interstitial fluid. If filtration pushes fluid and solutes out of the blood and into the interstitial fluid, reabsorption is the opposite. Reabsorption refers to the movement of fluid and solutes from the interstitial fluid back into the bloodstream. Reabsorption is the result of osmotic pressure or the osmotic pull of fluid. Osmotic pressure is the pressure that's required to prevent osmosis. The higher the solute concentration, okay, the more stuff that we have in a solution, the higher its osmotic pressure is or the higher its osmotic pull, its ability to pull water into the solution. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. We see that the diffusion of water or osmosis occurs when water flows towards a solution with the higher osmotic pressure or the higher concentration of solutes. For example, when we look at our capillaries and we see that, for example, we have a large concentration of solutes in the bloodstream. That means that the bloodstream has a higher osmotic pressure than the interstitial fluid because it has a higher concentration of solutes. We just said that water is going to flow towards the solution with the higher osmotic pressure or towards the solution with the higher concentration of solutes. So in this case, you would see that reabsorption, okay, which is driven by osmotic pressure, would cause water and solutes to go from the interstitial fluid back into the bloodstream because the bloodstream had a higher concentration of solutes present. So let's look at why that is. When we look at reabsorption and we look at osmotic pressures, again, we have to look at the overall osmotic pressure or the net colloid osmotic pressure of the blood. The net or overall osmotic pressure is the difference between the blood colloid osmotic pressure or the osmotic pressure of the blood and the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure or the osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. Again, when we look at our bloodstream, okay, that means that we have an osmotic pressure or an osmotic pull in the blood and we have an osmotic pressure that's in the interstitial fluid. When we look at these two osmotic pressures, we see that the blood colloid osmotic pressure is greater than the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure. So there's more osmotic pressure or more osmotic pull of the blood. And that's because the blood has all of these large plasma proteins that are suspended in it. Remember, most capillaries in our body don't have large enough gaps to allow these plasma proteins to leave the bloodstream. So when other fluid and other small solutes are getting filtered out of the blood, these plasma proteins are trapped in the blood. They're too big to leave. So they create a large concentration um, or a large osmotic pressure in the blood. So that means that all of these solutes, this large osmotic pressure that's in the blood, pulls fluid and small solutes that are in it back into the bloodstream. So because the blood colloid osmotic pressure is larger than the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure, that means that the net colloid osmotic pressure pulls water and solutes from interstitial fluid back into the blood. Okay, again, because the blood has a higher concentration of solutes, so it has more pull to pull water back into it. So we say that the osmotic pressure fuels reabsorption. When we look at capillary exchange, we actually have to combine all of these different pressures to see whether or not we're going to be pushing fluid and solutes out of the blood for filtration or whether we're going to be reabsorbing things back into the bloodstream. When we combine all of these pressures, the capillary hydrostatic and interstitial fluid hydrostatic, the blood osmotic and interstitial fluid osmotic, 
we get something called the net filtration pressure. The net filtration pressure or the overall pressure that's occurring when we combine all four of these pressures tells us whether or not we're going to be moving materials into the bloodstream or out of the bloodstream. Looking at the net filtration pressure, we can calculate it by looking at the difference between the net hydrostatic pressure, which we remember tends to push things out of the blood. Okay, so the net hydrostatic pressure pushing out minus the net osmotic pressure, which pulls back into the bloodstream. So net filtration pressure is the net hydrostatic pressure, which remember was capillary hydrostatic minus interstitial fluid hydrostatic. So net hydrostatic pressure pushing out minus the net osmotic pressure, which pulls in. Okay, so blood colloid osmotic minus interstitial fluid colloid osmotic. Again, the overall point here is that the overall pressure driving capillary exchange is the difference between the hydrostatic pressure pushing out of the bloodstream and the interstitial fluid um, osmotic pressure or the, the net osmotic pressure pulling back into the bloodstream. If this net filtration pressure is a positive value, that means that the pressure pushing out must be greater and we're going to be driving filtration. If this net filtration pressure is a negative, is a negative value, that means that this osmotic pressure must have been greater and we're going to be pulling back into the bloodstream or driving reabsorption. Again, we just said the capillary exchange occurs because of this net filtration pressure or the overall filtration pressure in our capillaries. When we look at the capillary bed, we see that this net filtration pressure is not constant across the capillary bed. Okay, the pressures don't remain constant, they change. When we look at the very beginning of a capillary bed, okay, so if we have the arterial leading into the capillary bed, then we have our capillary bed with all of our interconnected blood vessels, our interconnected capillaries. This is kind of a generic drawing. And then over here on this side, we have the end or the venule end of our capillary bed. So the blood comes in here at the arterial end, it flows through the capillaries, and then it leaves at the venule end. At the arterial end of the capillary bed, or the beginning of the capillary bed, we see that we have a lot of blood being pushed into these tiny vessels. So there's a lot of hydrostatic pressure pushing out. Okay, so because we have so much pressure pushing out, it means that the overall pressure okay, or the net filtration pressure is very high. It's a positive value. Remember, we said that when net filtration pressure is positive, that means that we're going to be pushing out of the bloodstream. So fluid moves out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid. Again, we call that filtration. So at the beginning of the capillary bed, we have filtration occur. We push fluid and solutes out of the blood into the interstitial fluid. Now, as we move down towards the latter half of this capillary bed, at the venule end of the capillary bed, we've lost a lot of that hydrostatic pressure because a lot of our fluid entered into the interstitial fluid. So we don't have nearly as much blood in here anymore, so there's not nearly as much pressure pushing out. However, we do still have all of these large plasma proteins that are stuck in the bloodstream that create a really high blood colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, so the osmotic pressure pulling back into the bloodstream is going to be high at the end of our capillary bed. That means that our net filtration pressure is negative. So we end up pulling, instead of pushing out, at the end of the capillary bed, we end up pulling fluid and solutes back into the bloodstream. So at the venule bed, at the venule end, we fuel reabsorption. So when we first enter the capillary bed, we filter out from the blood into the interstitial fluid. At the latter half of the capillary bed, we pull back into the bloodstream. Okay, so it's this cycle. Capillary exchange is a cycle of pushing out, and then pulling back in.
when we look at this change from filtration to reabsorption, we see that the transition point is not in the very center of the capillary bed. Rather, it's closer to the venous end. So again, we've got our arterial end, we look at our capillary bed, and then we have the venous end. So we come in and we start to filter out a bunch of fluid from the blood into the interstitial fluid. And the point at which we change from filtration to reabsorption, to pulling back in, is not directly in the middle. Okay, it's closer to the venous end. That means that we have more filtration occurring than reabsorption. Okay, the capillaries filter out more fluid than they reabsorb. So on average, about 24 liters per day of blood is filtered out of the bloodstream and only 20.4 liters a day is reabsorbed. That leaves an extra 3.6 liters of blood every day or fluid that's lost from the bloodstream and left out here in the interstitial fluid. Now we can't just leave that fluid out here. Otherwise we would lose so much blood that I mean, we wouldn't be able to function. We would die very quickly. We need that fluid to somehow make its way back into the bloodstream. What happens is we see that surrounding our blood capillaries, we have little lymphatic capillaries. Okay, so we've got lymphatic capillaries right here that are part of the lymphatic system, which is associated with our immune system. What happens is this extra 3.6 liters of fluid enters into the lymphatic capillaries and it travels through the lymphatic capillaries through our body. Every so often, these lymphatic capillaries bring this fluid through our lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes act as kind of a filter. Okay, they filter pathogens and debris out of the fluid. And these lymph nodes have numerous white blood cells present in them and numerous immune system cells. So if there happened to be any bacteria or viruses or pathogens in this fluid, it would get run through this lymph node and we would alert our immune system to the fact that we had an infection occurring. So this extra 3.6 liters that doesn't get brought back into the bloodstream gets cleaned out um, and gets scanned by the immune system as it goes through our lymphatic vessels. Now eventually these lymphatic vessels make their way back up to the subclavian vein and we dump this fluid back into the bloodstream at the subclavian. So the fluid makes its way back to the blood so we don't end up losing that volume from our blood. It's just that we clean it and screen it and then dump it back into the bloodstream.